Welcome back to the Thermo Diet Podcast. Today we've got a very special episode for you guys where we have a special guest and his name is Pedro do Amaral. Pedro, if you want to just give like a little background to yourself for the audience. I am a chemistry and math student at the moment. I am pursuing high level science with a master's degree inevitably. Right now I'm doing a second bachelor's. I have a bachelor's in biomedical sciences and uh, I'm very interested in the nutritional sphere and a lot of what we talk about um, I, I, we'll, we will talk about in the thermal podcast. Appreciate it. How did you get introduced to Ray or like the bioenergetic world? I learned about him actually through you guys. Um, 2015, he was posted on anabolicmen.com and, uh, it was in relation to carbohydrate intake and how that's important for reducing cortisol. And that was the first time I, I had actually considered about carbohydrate intake and cortisol levels in general. But then I got quickly disenamored because I saw that he was promoting Coca-Cola. And at the time, obviously, processed foods are not good for you until more recently in 2020 when he blew up again. And then I basically understood what his uh, explanations were for things like uh, Mexican Coke and so on. So it's been a while since I've known Ray, but only more recently did I get more interested. Yeah, it's it's great to see his work starting to blow up a little bit more and become more popular. But so we brought Pedro on our, to have a nice conversation. And I thought it'd be really fun to just pick your brain about how to prepare food pop properly, the benefits of cooking food, adding spices, um, fermenting foods, all that stuff. So uh, we're going to go ahead and dive in. So Pedro, why do we cook meat? Essentially, you want to break down the proteins a little bit so they, they're more bioavailable to consume. And also, um, just for taste purposes, I mean, I don't like eating raw meat. I don't know. Most people enjoy that, but there are some pieces of evidence. If you look inside like the literature, um, where it does suggest that people that do eat raw meat, they lose more weight more effectively because you're just not gaining as much calories. That would suggest that people are actually not consuming as much protein as they think they are from raw meat versus when it's cooked. And that, in my opinion, is just a basic understanding that you need, um, you, or you want to aim for the most bioavailable amount of protein. And the, and as does, as that is cooking provides that for most people. So that's pretty much mm -hmm. my take on that. And so generally when you're cooking food to a high enough heat, you are denaturing the proteins, right? So like the, imagine the protein, like a big knot hut and it's kind of coming apart. Is there a diminishing return? Like when you get to well done and like burnt cooking? I wouldn't say so because unless there's cross-linking where if you overcook it, it gets too brown. That's basically proteins cross-linking with other proteins and so on and sugars as well. Um, and in that case, they become advanced glycation end products, which is no good. However, there is less of that going on than there is more bioavailable um, proteins, peptides, and single amino acids that can be absorbed better. Okay. But I do think that just cooking overcooking your meat is obviously not a good thing for many reasons. So it's happening when you cook it too much and probably to, even when you cook it to a normal amount to a smaller degree, is this, are these things that are being digested and absorbed or where's the main issue with these? Cause I've, I'm a little bit confused on these in the literature. So with advanced glycation and products, they do get um, recognized by receptors in the gut called rage receptors for advanced glycation and products. And then that causes inflammatory cascades. And so even if you don't absorb it, if it doesn't go inside of your bloodstream and so on, um, it's still going to cause an effect within the tissue in the gut and it might cause inflammation and so on. However, if you do absorb it, most of the time it's neutralized by antibodies literally towards the advanced glycation end products. And that's not necessarily, I mean, it's a good thing that we neutralize it, but that's probably going to cause or in part going to cause an inflammatory response, right? Those antibodies. Yeah. Mostly. It, when when the body recognizes that it's there in the bloodstream and it secretes those anti, any, antibodies to it, it's also going to promote a pro-inflammatory cascade with cytokines and other factors. So do you think there's any difference between grilling, um, smoking, pan frying, um, general various methods of cooking? I think that in general, when you cook your when the meat gets brown, for example, you're still making most of the same products. Proteins are cross-linked with sugars. You're going to have some advanced glycation end products, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, basically the smoke that you don't want to inhale essentially. Um, and so it doesn't really matter which way you cook it. You're still going to wind up with those negative products, but then also with the um, protein that you need in the first place. So in my opinion, there isn't that much of a difference versus searing a steak versus um, sauteing versus uh, baking. Like you're still going to make the same uh, byproducts. So slow cooking 
is a little bit different because those are for the more collagenous cuts. And that's basically to denature those collagenous proteins, which are very tough in my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. The collagen in general, the slow cooking, slow cooking would be the best approach for collagen specifically. Yeah. In my opinion. Gotcha. Do you have any favorite collagenous cuts? Um, oxtail definitely. And then, uh, also, also buco, you know, that kind of specific, right? Yeah. I got to get into that. I, it looks so good. I need, I need to, it just takes a little bit more effort, but I feel like it's very well yeah. worth it. Really good. Okay, cool. Um, and I know you've been a proponent of adding sp- certain spices to your food to mitigate some of those advanced glycation end products and the polycyclic aromatic, hi- aromatic hydrocarbons, just like the bad things from cooking. Can you, is that l- because of the antioxidants that are in certain spices? Yeah, they're, they definitely, they contain antioxidants. Um, and then, the other thing is they can basically prevent the absorption as effectively as if there were no spices in the food in the first place. Um, the other thing is they stop the immune cascade. So if you have a little bit of turmeric with your food, for example, it's going to help reduce immunity or an inappropriate immune response to the food, for example. So it does help with that as well. So yeah, there's an antioxidant aspect, there's a chemistry aspect, and there's an immunity aspect to a lot of spices and using them with your foods. And uh, I like to go for simple, tasteful spices like paprika, um, black pepper, um, and then obviously some herbs as well, like oregano really does provide some antioxidant properties. You know, parsley is the highest per capita of uh, apigenin, one of those. Um, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so I've been using that. I'm not a, a spice guy, but I've been trying to use paprika or parsley specifically for that reason. But I've been messing up a little bit with other ones as well. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, the apigen is helpful for so many different things too, like estrogen detox- detoxification. So I can see how it would benefit to consume it with the food. Mm-hmm. And what about things like um, herbs, like garlic and onions as well? Is that have a similar yeah, kind so, of effect? Yeah. The sulfur, uh, organosulfur compounds in these sulfur rich vegetables, they really support uh, detoxification of most unwanted compounds, secondary metabolites, xenoestrogens. Like if if you open, say for example, you had some meat and it was wrapped in plastic, like most meat is. As you open the plastic, there are microplastic compounds that are going to wind up in the meat in the first place. The sulfur rich vegetables help to bind and eliminate that and also promote general detox processes in the gut that's already present. So really helpful for that. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, like evolutionarily, we like evolve to eat these things that like to combine these things that taste good together, like the garlic and meat or bread and butter and all that stuff. Do you have any chicken or egg thoughts or kind of both? Yeah, that, that's interesting because taste, it's not like the first organism that ever developed had taste in the first place. So in my opinion, uh, if it was selected for that, it would suggest that yes, there's a reason why we want these food combinations, not just a, there's not just a dopamine associated response of like reward signaling. It's, there are, specific purposes in the body for these specific combination of foods. Mm -hmm. Even if we don't fully understand what they are yet. Yeah. Or how they came about. It's very interesting. I I like to think about things evolutionarily. Like I know it can get too far, but it is at some point, like how we got here Mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, so I have said, and you feel free to disagree with me on this, that spices are like the real vegetables and same thing with herbs, I would say. And, um, also like the sulfur rich onions and garlic where it's like, I'm not a huge fan of the cruciferous vegetables. I think they can be fine in small quantities and we'll talk about those as well if you cook them well. Um, but I feel like a lot of the beneficial parts of can that get tagged towards like the cruciferous vegetables, like the greens are a lot of, have to do with the spices and herbs and the garlic and onions and stuff like that. What do you think about that? I see. Interesting. I didn't, I didn't consider from that perspective before. Um, when I look at, for example, food chemistry, I look at just the isolated compounds or the foods themselves and not a meal associated with the food. And there are a lot of good compounds in cruciferous, cruciferous vegetables, but I didn't consider, for example, that maybe pepper with garlic, I mean, uh, with a uh, cabbage, for example, would actually support the antioxidant mechanisms or the anti estrogen mechanisms. Mm. It's highly possible. So there are a lot of food synergies as well. For example, if you, um, if you cook garlic, or actually not garlic, if you cook uh, any food that has sulforaphane and you add mustard seed afterwards, after you, it's cooked, because uh, it degrades with heat, after you add mustard seed, the sulforaphane molecule can be made once again. So there are synergies with multiple different foods and spices in specific or herbs as well. Um, so I don't doubt that. 
but I still think that most cruciferous vegetables also have really beneficial compounds like um, diendulomethane, dim, dim. anti-estrogenic. So uh, let's hear your uh, respect on, not your respect, your take on cruciferous vegetables. So I think I do think they can cause iodine issues with the goitrogenic properties, but they do, as you said, dim, have some unique compounds, as all foods do. Um, they're also very fibrous. So I think that can be an issue for digestion. So what do you think about the cruciferous vegetables and again, how to prepare them properly if you are going to eat them? Yeah. So I, I'm somebody that eats them raw and I've seen a lot of benefit in myself from consuming it raw. I definitely don't feel the same way when I cook it or saute. Um, for example, if I eat Brussels, sprout, Brussels sprouts baked, I don't feel like it really helps me. Um, it actually makes me feel worse than if I eat it raw. And I realized that one of the most common effects that I get almost all the time from eating cruciferous vegetables is less water retention in my muscles. And so I looked a lot more shredded and that has to do with a reduction of estrogen. However, on the flip side, somebody else that would eat raw vegetables might see some negative consequences, like what you mentioned with digestive issues, thyroid issues. And I think a lot of it comes down to how well the individual um, is able to tolerate a lot of these foods in general. The lower your baseline health, the worse it's going to be for you to vegetables because it's going to make you feel crappy. But then also personal genetics mat matter a little bit. How well do they convert um, T4 to T3? If they're not a good converter, well, then these uh, cruciferous compounds can make it a lot worse. I don't personally see that effect, but maybe I'm somebody that has perfectly normal thyroid health. I, I've always been kind of slim. So that could be a reason why my baseline is just a little bit higher. And then in terms of cooking, I do think that if you cook um, most vegetables, you lose a lot of the good phytonutrients, depending on how it's cooked. Boiling and steaming is less than if you saute and bake it, for example. And uh, a lot of them are water soluble. And so if you're boiling it, you retain some of it. And um, if you cook it, it's basically going to denature or become a different compound altogether. And because of that, it depends on what the goal is. Is, is the person looking to acquire as much phytonutrients? Well, then raw might be the best way. If they're looking to just acquire a little bit more fiber, well, then cooking it would be better because then it's less tough on the gut. In terms of the phytochemicals and like the anti-nutrients, what do you think about some of them? I know oxalates has been, have been indicated in some actual health benefits as well, especially for the teeth in particular. I don't know about the bones. Uh, I do know they can cause issues and they can cause kidney issues if in excess. But I think it's also largely because, you know, you're probably slamming a ton of oxalates and not getting enough calcium. These compounds are really negative in the certain context of certain nutritional deficiencies. Um, again, genetics matter a little bit. How, how do you break it down? Is your liver and your kidneys healthy in the first place? But then there are some people that are, that are just plain old sensitive to these compounds. And I've met people like that where they just can't eat spinach. No matter what they do, they're super healthy otherwise or else they get really bad symptoms from it. Um, one thing that I have recently learned was that yeast and yeast infections in the gut and gut dysbiosis could also drive the production of oxalic acid that eventually makes oxalate crystals. So that could be a contributor as well to people's symptoms and um, not just the fibrous vegetables. I, didn't, I did not know though that oxalates in general contribute to good dental health. That's new to me. I heard someone, I haven't actually read the paper myself, so I could be wrong, but uh, I heard um, Extreme Health Radio mentioned that in, I think in small quantities, the calcium oxalate crystals are protective of the enamel. Um, that makes sense in general because of calcium deposits in teeth. Yeah. And it's just, it's really just interesting because I feel like in some sense, the you know, every, every view has its downfalls and like the carnivore view, it's like, I don't know if we were to all eat carnivore, a, like there would be just a lot of dead cows, but uh, it, it would, <laughs> it's just like, it just doesn't seem natural to just eat, eat like one thing. And even like, as you said, like, I'm not a fan of the cruciferous vegetables, you know, you make me intrigued to kind of try them. I've never enjoyed the taste. So I found Chris and Thermo. I was like, huh, this all makes sense to, sense to me chemically in my science mind. And I was like, I never like vegetables anyway. Chris is not a huge proponent of vegetable or the cruciferous. And I was like, all right, but it is interesting what you say. And, um, the fact that dim is pretty potently estrogenic. Are there any other compounds in the vegetables that come to your, to mind? Oh man, I forgot where you get this one from, but this is like even more potent than them um, in terms of anti-estrogenic and it's chrysin, C-H-R-Y-S-I-N. Uh, it's found in small quantities in honey, right? Uh, I don't recall. If I think you might know more than me in this. 
I, I think I think it might. I remember I've written some articles just on food. I think it might be found in small quantities in honey. Yeah, that that's one that I can think of. But um, what else? Um, I guess indoles certain like I three C indole three carbonyl is one. Many indoles are anti estrogenic in a sense. But nonetheless, it also depends on how much you're consuming because these same compounds that are supportive can immediately switch and become negative if you pass a certain threshold. And I think certain people that are carnivores can't manage vegetables, not because it's uh, generally just toxic, but rather they can't break down these other compounds as effectively because eventually they're going to go to the liver. What if they have um, sit enzyme mutations and then their liver can't process it well? They might have a negative side effect at the same dose that I might have a good benefit from the compound. That is really interesting. <clears throat> On that lines, how do you try and interpret these compounds and the data on them in the cellular level up to like, cause it's really hard. We can't really get data on a lot of these in the human level because we don't really see the biological effects, but you have the in vitro. And the question, a lot of times, in my opinion, the difference between the in vitro and the human effects is what actually gets into the cell. Um, yeah, that I think it's, that's one contributor, but then there's like also how well is it broken down? How well is it, um, created an effect as well? So here's an example. If, a human being, for example, had a mutation, some enzyme that reduces glutathione production, no matter how much of these uh, antioxidants they're taking in from their food, from vegetables or herbs in specific, they won't boost their glutathione levels because they just can't. And so you would see no clinical effect from that. Mm -hmm. And then somebody else that might be a hyper responder would see a really good effect from that. And they might become vegan and, and instead of uh, having a more omnivorous kind of diet because they see a benefit out of that. So I think the, the, there's more to consider uh, in addition to just how well it gets transported inside of the cells in the first place. Up next, dairy. To pasteurize or not to pasteurize? I definitely don't agree with pasteurization, but I, I understand the mainstream view on this. Listeria, um, what else is it? Anthrax, um, Bacillus anth anthracis is the bacteria. These are all really bad bacteria that you really don't want in your milk in the first place. And you're, most people are going to have a negative side effect from them. However, this is also dependent on how healthy the cow is. How's the farming practices? Was it raised on a pasture? Did it get f uh, fed grains about six months after it was born? Like all of these contribute to the, the health of the milk in the first place and the desanitation of the milk in a sense. Um, and so I don't agree with pasteurization. You get a lot more benefit out of it than you do uh, with raw milk than you do um, with pasteurized milk. But if you're just looking for calcium, there's really no big difference between the two. Yeah, my view on the pasteurization is just that it would kind of took a shortcut. Just here, you don't have, you can treat this cow like terribly, you can feed it plastic, and then you can still get decent quality milk if you just kill everything that's inside of it. But what do you think is the main benefits of the raw milk? Is it the probiotics? Yeah, so the, on the flip side, when it's raw, you do get a bunch of good bacteria. And the type of bacteria is the same one that you, most of it is the same that you'd find in probiotics. So like, what's the disconnect here? It's, it's still the same thing. Um, and so you got to benefit from that. I do think though that where the real benefit of raw milk comes from is raw colostrum, the first milk mm. of the cow. That's where you get most of the immunoglobulins that support immunity, reduce gut inflammation, among a ton of other different peptides that have not even been fully characterized yet that has some effect like, um, what is that one? BPC 150, I think it is basically a peptide for the gut. Imagine that probably a million times over of all these new peptides that have never been discovered in colostrum, for example. Yeah. I've written about that where it's like every supplement was once a food pretty much. Yeah. It's that's like, a like, good way to see it. Yeah. Cause it's like creatine. It's like, like oh dude, it's going to kill you. It's like, dude, it's it just eat a steak if you're really that worried about it. I mean, not mm -hmm. that that's this one-to-one, -one, but it's, we, we are that a lot of drugs, I guess we, I mean, we have, we're very smart people, but a lot of the best things that we have are made from like evolution, just naturally occurring. Yeah. It's, it's, that's a, the evolutionary perspective really puts things into light. It's like, there wasn't a creatine supplement back in the day. It wound up in food for a reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's a beautiful way to think about things in my opinion. Um, so I heard you mention that you, I don't know if you've suggested or, but you've thought it could be useful for someone that's lactose intolerant to, I'm not gonna say microdose, but uh, phase in kefir, um, mm. which kefir is basically a fermented milk. And I believe your argument was that you can consume the probiotics or the bacteria that ferment lactose so that you have a better capacity to break down lactose yourself. 
Yeah. Yeah. With the enzyme for lactase, they'll, they'll be breaking down in the first place. And usually when you do eat kefir, most of the probiotics that you get come in one end, go out the other, they're transient. However, if you do it consistently for a long period of time at small doses, it's likely that some will become permanent in the microflora. And then that helps you breaking down with breaking down, um, milk proteins in general, not just like lactose and sugars and reduces the overall effect of the lactose associated gut disturbances that most people face. Mm. So do you think most of the lactose, um, disturbances people face from their gut is from not being able to digest it in their small intestine and it making into the colon or a little bit of both? Oh, I think it would be more colon, um, not just the small intestines, because in the colon is where most of the bacteria are going to be found. And that's where they're going to ferment most of the sugars. So lactose, uh, galactose, all of the different sugars that they that you find in milk, and then they can use it for their own purposes. Usually what winds up happening is gas builds up because they're fermenting. Um, and then that's when most people have side effects, in my opinion. But I do know people that as soon as they drink milk, they have the runs. And I'm not quite sure how to explain that other than immunological. The immune system senses milk peptides or proteins. And it's like, oh, no, we have this in our system again. Time to flush it out. That is interesting. Yeah, I started drinking milk again like a couple of years ago because I didn't buy it for myself during college. It was just like I wasn't going to go and buy a gallon of milk <laughs> at the time. And then I started phasing it back in. I, I should have went very slowly and probably slow but sure, but I'm not the smartest guy when it comes to myself. And uh, just I definitely had some of the runs for a couple of weeks, but it was funny. Like it does go for me, at least it def definitely went away. Like now I can drink any kind of milk pretty much and I'll be fine. Some better than others, but it is interesting because I drank it a ton as a kid Took a couple year gap and my ability to digest milk seemingly like went, went away very diminished significantly, I would say. And then it came back. I don't know if this is correct. It's been a long time since I looked at this, but I could have sworn that some humans have the innate ability to break down lactose with a lactase enzyme. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's because of bacteria or our own enzymes. And uh, if you don't consume it often, it goes dormant, essentially, and you don't produce it as much. And then obviously the need is not there. Yeah, Ray has talked about that a little bit. I don't know if he phrased it exactly like that, but he said that our capacity to produce the lactase enzymes increases if you consume it more. And to me, it would make sense. I don't have any data on this, but if you don't consume something, and I think that's a lot of the issues with these elimination diets too, is that if you cut everything out, when you phase it back in, it's like, like oh, like you keto, you drink a glass of orange juice, like no wonder your blood glucose is spiking. You haven't had any orange juice in six years. Um, so on the topic of fermented foods, um, what about sourdough? I, I'm somebody that does great with either non-fermented bread or fermented bread. Um, I do understand that some people just have complete inability to tolerate um, wheat and other grains in general. And with fermenting um, wheat in specific, you reduce the amount of peptides like gluten and all the other peptides that are immunogenic. And you also increase the bioavailability of other good peptides that you can absorb that might have a beneficial effect in the gut. I like sour though, but even then I know some people that just can't tolerate any wheat whatsoever, whether it's fermented or not. So um, for those people, I guess it's better for them to go grain free or just consume white rice and other starches. However, I'm, I'm a fan of sourdough. So what do you think about the lactic acid that's in both kefir and sourdough? Do you think it's a concern? No, I don't think actually it's probably a benefit because in general, you want a slightly more acidic environment in certain areas of the gut. And that prov that's provided by lactobacillus bacteria. They mm -hmm. produce lactic acid. And if you're already consuming these bacteria that produce higher amounts of lactic acid, it's supporting digestive processes. But I will say though, um, excess of lactic acid and it's signaling can promote inflammatory processes. And that's where it's associated with like colon cancer, for example. That's really interesting because I had never considered that it, like the lactic acid could actually be a digestive aid. Um, how much do you, and also I never had really put into, well, I guess we make hydrochloric acid. We don't really make lactic acid in our stomach. Um, how, how much do you think of the lactic acid, acid is actually absorbed? I'm not quite sure. I don't, I don't even think it's absorbed that much as it, as it is almost like a signaling molecule locally, because what I've seen in reports with like IBS, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis is that the lactate itself is a signaling molecule for bacteria to support uh, production of short chain fats. Mm -hmm. And that reduces an, an immune cascade within the gut, improving symptoms. 
it improves the symptoms in those. Yes. Yeah, so wow. Basically acting as a signal for bacteria to say, oh, look, we got what we wanted. Let's produce anti-inflammatory molecules. That's really interesting. Um, on a slight tangential note, have you seen the research at all? It's, I think it was Brad Schoenfeld's paper on lactate as a potential signaling molecule for increasing testosterone synthesis in the Leydig cells and your testes. I wouldn't be surprised. In fact, lac lactic acid would, it increases, or sorry, it decreases pH. And um, a consequence of that is the enzyme that produces DHT will be more active because it's a pH dependent enzyme. Huh. It has a higher production rate at like a pH of 5.5. So you'll produce more T, more DHT effectively um, with higher lactic acid, but I'm sure there's a threshold. You cross it, it's going to be a negative effect. What do you think about the whole um, acid base? Uh, like, oh, you're too acidic. Like, I think they generally say people are mostly too acidic. Um, my perspective on it, and I, I'm not the most informed on it, is basically it's just like you need, <clears throat> we want to be acidic in certain places, and that's largely from providing the proper nutrients, but we also want to be, you know, our cells should be, I mean, our cells should be slightly acidic, but it's generally from a, a energy, energy production, having enough ATP and B having enough of the electrolytes to keep that balance intact. I understand where they come. I, first of all, I agree with exactly everything you said. I, I want to play the devil's advocate advocate mm -hmm. for them. I understand what they're thinking about when you're a lot more alkaline and basic you have greater electron flow, you have greater electron density. And so if you have more electrons, you can produce more energy. That's the theory behind it. However, just like a, a circuit, if you provide too much energy, it short circuits the, the circuits essentially. And the same thing happens in the cell. As soon as things get too alkaline, a lot of things go wrong. And so I don't ascribe at all to the alkaline acid-based theory of health. And like you said, some tissues need to be acidic, some tissues need to be alkaline. If you want to find, if somebody wanted to find out just how quickly things go wrong, if one is too alkaline, hyperventilate and see what happens to your brain and how you feel afterwards. That's basically increasing the amount of O2, pH goes up, you feel lightheaded, you can basically go into a, um, a nervous breakdown because your nerves are not firing in the appropriate way. CO2 is important for nerve signaling in general, and that's an acidic-like molecule. You need a balance. Yeah, I think that's one of the most neglected areas in modern health today, just CO2. I feel like people just completely forget about it. And I feel like in a huge part, that's the whole framework of Ray's work is a, in some degree about CO2. It is. It, it, he's basically saying when CO2 levels are adequate, your cells can use more oxygen. The way to get that, though, is through carbohydrate intake, because if you burn fat, you actually produce more cellular oxygen through like hydrogen peroxide and so on. And uh, I agree with him. You, you do feel a difference, especially when you consume carbohydrates after you're, you, if you're able to consume carbs without having any kind of side effects, no blood sugar issues and so on, you feel calm, you feel relaxed, you feel like you're aware, your brain is, is on. Um, whereas if you're in a highly ketogenic state, which I've been multiple times, yes, I'm, a, I'm very alert and mentally aware, but it's not like I'm the same um, in terms of like energy. I'm a lot more angsty. I'm a lot more stressed out in, in a sense. I, I react to things a lot quicker in a um, anger kind of mm -hmm. manner. So my tolerance for things is low. I don't know if I was ever in, I probably was in a keto, ketotic state because I would do, it was crazy. I was, you know, Greg O'Gallagher? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was very into Greg. That's how I got introduced to Chris. It's, and I was landscaping, waking up at uh, 5.30 on my Jocko Will and Grind, going to the gym, landscaping for eight hours. Was, or so that, that was probably like five or six o'clock. I'd come home and eat dinner and then go to jiu-jitsu and then eat some ice cream. So I was just like 10 hours of just fat. And like I, looking like at the time I was set 18, 20. I, I mean, I felt fine. I felt great. Like, you're like, oh, like you don't need to eat auto autophagy, all that stuff. But looking back, I was like, damn, I definitely was on a, like a thin cord, you know? Like now I feel like much more mellow. Yeah, th that's what Ray talks about. Um, the I forget exactly how he states it, but essentially the higher energy state is one that's calm but ready. And it's very true. It, I feel that essentially um, when I have, for example, a nice carbohydrate meal with enough protein, and then I take niacinamide and also have some coffee in the morning, mm -hmm. I'm ready to go. My brain is on. I do great in school and so on. And it's such a night and day difference because I've contrasted it so many times with ketogenic diet, carnivore approaches. Again, you're mentally aware on keto and carnivore, but you're not mentally as prepared. If that makes sense. Yeah. I also think a lot of the mental benefits people are getting from keto carnivore is because they are eliminating foods that have issues 
Leslie talked about preparing sourdough properly or masa harina, which we'll talk about next. Um, and these things, if they if they are experienced or some degree of preservation, if they have leaky gut, the carnivore diet is probably the most easily digested diet. I would think maybe in top, you could add yeah. simple sugars into that as well. Um, but we're yeah. just very good at digesting protein. So it's like when you take all these foods out that are messing with you, it's really easy to feel a lot better. I agree. I think that's very true. I think most people that have issues with most foods in general and they go carnivore and they see a benefit. There's one um, factor that I haven't considered before, and it's been recent that I thought about it. Um, gut virus infections, enteroviruses could contribute to essentially food intolerances out of nowhere. So they're completely fine until they hit 20 years old, they get a gut infection, or they don't even know that they got one. And then all of a sudden afterwards, they're unable to tolerate foods as effectively. That could be one of the contributors and not the food itself. Hmm. How do you think mechanistically, if you have any uh, ideas of how that would contribute? Oh, th this is actually really well characterized. And it's one of the leading causes of IBS, essentially, in people that have never had, had IBS before. The, For example, with norovirus, what it does is it changes how the immune landscape, the entire immune system within the gut, reacts to certain molecules. And also, molecular mimicry plays a role. So the virus can produce certain proteins that look similar to proteins in, say, for example, wheat as a um, just the first thing I can think of. And then it'll always target wheat thinking that it's one of those oh, virus wow. proteins. Exactly. So it makes an immune response to that. That's one of the simple, in fact, this is also seen with multiple sclerosis with Epstein-Barr virus. Many different viruses do this and cause the same effect. It's very much possible that it also happens with food and it's documented that it does happen with norovirus and IBS in specific. Do you think the role of viruses then in chronic health conditions is a little bit very overlooked? Yeah, until more recently with COVID. I, that's one good thing about the pandemic, I'd say, is uh, that researchers are taking it a lot more seriously in terms of how pathogens contribute to a lot of the conditions people face that they otherwise didn't think it was because of pathogens. Interesting. So I'm not, I'm very uneducated on this, but so are these pathogens just kind of thrive? I know like we have E. coli and H. pylori, which are more bacterial pathogens that are like living in our gut. And that kind of made sense to me. But are you saying that in these things, these are, are they dormant viruses that are just kind of hanging on or are they actively just you know, camping out somewhere? Some some can be dormant. I don't think norovirus is one that you have dormant. It's basically a day or two and then it goes away and you don't have it again until you get like a new strain. But in relation to bacteria too, even some bacteria can be commensal. They're good in some moments. They're bad in others. You increase stress, you increase inflammation. All of a sudden, the E. coli bacteria that was breaking down the proteins turns to be a pathogen. So a lot of it does come down to general baseline health as well. Mm. Um, but I do think that they, some of them can be dormant, the viruses, and then some of them can also be transient. And that uh, depends on which species you're looking at. All right. So back, back to food. <laughs> no problem. Oh, <laughs> uh, sorry. That was, a, that was a great tangent. I hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, but Masa Harina, we talked a little bit about this. Um, and if yeah. you guys don't know, I was in, we we're talking about this. I was in Mexico recently and Masa Harina translates to corn flour. And I was talking, we were riding some cowboys, we were riding some horses, not cowboys. <laughs> and they all knew about the nixtamalization process where you basically you bake the corn in lime and it actually increases the nutrient availability. I don't know if they would have, I don't know, I don't know how to say niacin in Spanish, but I don't know if they would have known the specific vitamins, but they knew that if you don't eat um, the nixtamalized corn, that it can cause nutrient deficiencies. So Pedro, how did you, how does that exactly happen? Oh man, I haven't looked at exactly what happens with niacin reduction. Uh -huh. If I can think of it from a first principles perspective, you have the certain anti-nutrients that essentially reduces either absorption of L-tryptophan or conversion of L-tryptophan into niacin. Mm. That is the only two possibilities here. Okay. And uh, how that gets taken care of with nixtamilization, I'm just going to call it nix from now on. That's fine. <laughs> um, is the pH essentially causes a breakdown of the compounds that are anti-nutrients. And so they can't have the same effect anymore. Oh, interesting. Um, the and higher you were, pH. You were also talking about the effects of the NYX on, uh, what was it, on the mold, the mycotoxins. Yeah, 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 mycotoxins in general. Um, same thing, so the same process where the you have a alkaline pH from lime, for example, and it converts the otherwise anti-nutrients into normal compounds that don't have an effect. Similar thing occurs with mycotoxins. It basically adds, um, for example, hydrogen atom to an area that it otherwise shouldn't have one. 
and it renders the molecule completely inactive. And so it doesn't have the same effect anymore. It's essentially a way to reduce not only anti-nutrients, but um, contaminants in general. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, speaking of uh, anti-nutrients, we were talking about this before. What do you think about phytate and its relationship? Because it's very chemically similar to biotin, right? Or yeah, nozitol, yeah. Nozitol. I, if I, oh, man, I don't remember the exact shape of the molecule. It's It looks like a sugar, and then I think there's other groups around. So essentially, it does mimic um, a lot of B vitamins also, not just like the inositol. Okay, which is interesting. Do you think phytic acid can then have some beneficial effects? I do know that it's used in, in some cancer therapies for some reason. I don't remember exactly what it does, but it many of these anti-nutrients can be used as chemotherapy essentially so that's interesting that is that's crazy all right and the uh, last food in the list and then we'll dive a little bit into cooking <laughs> um nuts seeds and legumes how to prepare them how do you feel about them yeah the sprouting process is important and i think if you can sprout them it really does in increase the overall nutrient yield um i don't i'm somebody that in the context of seeds and nuts and stuff, I don't do good with them. I never felt good with eating a lot of macadamia nuts, pumpkin seeds, whatever it is. And uh, maybe it's something personal with me, but I know other people that have no issues with them. I think that when it comes to nutrients though, um, like zinc, for example, you're going to get a much lower amount than most people assume unless you sprout it because of a higher amount of things like phytic acid that would be present in nuts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sprouting seems so counterintuitive because it's like it's almost like you're planting it. Um, and if you guys don't know that sprouting is basically you're putting it in water so that the it basically starts to grow. Am I correct on that? And the nutrients as a result start to get used pretty much and are opened up from these storage forms, which are like the anti nutrients generally. They like kind of are plant storage proteins like gluten, and they get opened up more into a usable form that we can digest. At the flip side of that, though, there's also more. Uh unfortunately, anti-nutrients that also get produced when you sprout it. Like with uh, um, broccoli sprouts, you know, this. It, it's sprouting, it produces sulforaphane, that's also considered an anti-nutrient, mm -hmm. as much as it is, as it is a good compound. Um, so you do, you get some good stuff out of it, but you also get a couple of negative things out of it when you sprout. I want to try sprouted sourdough flour so you can get the, I feel like that would just be probably the easiest to digest and also the most nutritious. I didn't consider that one before. <laughs> yeah, I just, I think because... I don't know. It's just interesting to think because that's how they've been preparing it for years. And I don't know. I feel like some some of the things that people have issues with is just a lot of times from preparing it properly. I personally don't have any issues with regular flour either. Um, do you do you think there's anything wrong with consuming regular non sourdough flour besides you know it's a little bit less nutritious and a little bit less protein? I think the only other thing I can think of is fortification, um, where it's like excess fortified um, trace metals and micronutrients that can be a problem. Yeah. My Otherwise, yeah. My perspective, other than it tastes phenomenal, <laughs> is that uh, I don't really think there's any documented benefits or even proposed benefits to gluten. Um, yeah, I haven't seen anything where it's like there's some antioxidants. It just seems like it's all downsides. So the more you can reduce <laughs> that, in my opinion, yeah. the better. It's true. I've never seen a good thing about gluten. That's a good <laughs> point. Cool. So let's dive a, bit, a little bit into uh, Chef Pedro cooking up. Um, do you think there are certain places where certain fats are better than others. And I'm generally assuming you're a proponent of the saturated fats and maybe olive and avocado oil for cooking. Well, I think vegetable oils are really good. No, I'm kidding with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just I, take yeah, shots, just raw shots of vegetable yeah. oil. Gets me going it's in the not happening. Um, yeah, I do think that my, so here's how I use fats. I use mostly ghee, grass-fed butter, or coconut oil to cook. And then olive oil, I never cook with because of its lower smoking point, even though it does contain a large amount. If it's a good quality olive oil, it contains a large amount of antioxidants, like a hydroxy tyrosol is one that's mm -hmm. really good. And um, I like to maintain it raw, though. So I'll, I'll use it over rice after it's cooked mm. or over a meal after it's cooked. And I, I like the taste of it like that. But otherwise, those are my only fats, the only source of fats that I use. I don't use any kind of nut butters. I don't use any vegetable oils whatsoever. Do you like tallow if you can get your hands I, on it? I, you know, I used to until I realized when I was looking at the back of the package, how much polyunsaturated fats is a component of uh, tallow. Really? Unfortunately, yeah, depends on the source though. If you have it from like a good farmer that doesn't feed their cow soy and all of these other grains, it's going to be lower. But most of these sources of tallow, even with good brains, I, I was looking at the back of the package and I see 1.5 grams of monounsaturated fat, 
out of 14 grams of total fat intake. And then like seven grams of um, saturated fat. So the rest has to be polyunsaturated. They just don't label it on the package. And that's when I was like, wow, I'm consuming way more than I thought I was with a lot of these uh, bovine products or duck fat, pig fat, doesn't matter which one it is. So I just stopped using tallow altogether. Interesting. Ray talked about this a little bit, how where you raise an animal will partially determine um, its polyunsaturated fat content. So colder weather animals, even like, so you can grow yeah. soy in the cold, it'd be mostly PUFA. Grow soy in the tropics, it's mostly saturated. And I was actually, so we're supposed in the repeat form, I didn't really look into it. I thought it made sense that the ruminant animals are actually pretty high in PUFAs. They're like 30, 35%, particularly the, not the ruminant in general, but like uh, venison, um, wild game. Um, and that to me made sense, at least in part that like the colder weather animals, I mean, it is like a cellular antifreeze, right? It's going to slow your metabolic rate. It's going to help literally be an insulator. Do you think that kind of makes sense? Yeah, that that's all pretty a uh, common thing to see with a lot of animals and um, even plants as well. The reason why um, some plants can be a little more fluid than others comes down to how much poof is a component of their general makeup. Um, but I don't know if like with soy, if that's a thing, like how much more saturated can soy get? I highly doubt it's going to get any more saturated than maybe, I don't know, whatever the normal concentration, let's say it's like 10%. And you grow in the tropics, maybe like 12 to 15% mm. of its components are saturated fat. But with, with animals, yeah, it does seem like the further up north you are, the more the proof of content versus the further down south, the more the saturated fat. And again, that comes down to stability and um, the greater amount of heat requires a, a hardier kind of fat that'll be saturated fat. That would, it also kind of makes sense in the regard that you, know, you don't eat, for, well, you eat cows when they're very young and uh, we tend to be more saturated when we were very young and accumulate polyunsaturated fats as we age. So if you're going to eat a 12 year old deer, proportionally, that would probably be a lot less saturated, even if they're in the same climate than the two year old deer or the two year old cow. I didn't think about that. I, maybe age does play a role. I think we accumulate um, negative fats anyways, as we grow older. So it wouldn't be surprising to me for other animals to do the same as they get older. Yeah. It's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. It's interesting to think about. Um, do you, have you ever looked into anything, and I don't know if anything exists, about mitigating PUFA absorption without, you know, like, like how, how can yeah. I slam vegetable oils without absorbing any of it? Yeah, that, I'm not quite sure if there, if, if there even was a way to reduce it, I highly doubt that uh, it would be strong enough of a reduction. A lot of these fats get incorporated into cell membranes easily because of their chemistry. The more unsaturated it is, the easier it is for just for it to swiggle in there. The more saturated, the more they kind of bundle up together into a hard, um, if you can imagine, it's like a hard mass. And uh, the more, the less saturated, so the more unsaturated, the more wide they are in terms of like the spacing between molecules. That's why it's liquid at room temperature versus a solid at room temperature. Mm. So same thing happens in the gut. It's like, oh, these fats are easy to incorporate. Let's pull one at a time or through my seals that essentially get transported to uh, the fossil lipid membrane cells. And uh, because of that, I doubt that anything really exists that would be so strong that it basically inhibits 99% absorption. Um, I think the most important thing is reduction overall while you increase the amount of antioxidant intake. So not just vitamin E, but vitamin A, vitamin D is important because it does align in the membrane. Um, a lot of the fat soluble compounds in plants like hydroxytyrosol again in olive oil, it'll wind up in the, the plasma membrane of cells. Really? Astaxanthine winds up in the plasma membrane. And so the more antioxidants you have around there, even if you were to have a large amount of PUFA, the less of it will get oxidized. Have you ever heard of polycosinols in olive oil? Yeah, yeah. Georgie's a big um, fan of that. Do you have any thoughts? I, I'm also, yeah, it's like a waxy like fat. And uh, they're essentially supposed to be part of the vitamin E matrix. So, you know, tocopherols mm -hmm. and tocotrienols, they're vitamin E, but then you also have polycosinols they're also acting in concert with vitamin E to support uh, membrane stability. Interesting. Do you have any thoughts on the tocotrienols versus the, so the tocotrienols are basically just slightly less saturated versions of the tocopherols. Um, do you have any thoughts? I, I think that chemically what's most understood are the tocopherols and they were characterized that way because of um, how effective of an antioxidant they were. So that's why they include D-alpha or d tocopherol acetate as the uh, main vitamin E form, mm. maybe because it has the greatest antioxidant capability. Nonetheless, I think if you include all of them, you're going to have the greatest boost in general. 
Do you think a lot of these compounds that we take because they're antioxidants, like you said, D, A, and E, also are important but less under less emphasized for their hormonal effects as well? Yeah, yeah. Not just antioxidant effects, hormonal effects, um, signaling effects as well. If you have a certain amount of vitamin D in, inside of the cell, a lot of cell signaling pathways change towards a more homeostatic state. That's why it's used for psoriasis, for eczema, for autoimmune conditions. It's not just the anti-inflammation that occurs. It's how cells literally change behavior because of these compounds. Yeah, I tend to think about things like the way I've tried to view the cell and I've tried to dive more into um, what's his name's work, uh, uh, association and Duxin, Gilbert Ling, association mm -hmm. of Duxin hypothesis. And it's very hard to understand. I don't know if you have dove into it a little bit, but... Uh, I tend to try and think of the cell as either fatty or watery and watery tends to be more estrogenic, more unsaturated um, versus fatty tends to be more saturated, less, the water is more structured, more bound to proteins. And that's kind of why I thought the decopherols might be more beneficial for those effects and also the hormonal effects that they're exerting because they're anti-estrogenic. Yeah, no, I could see that being a factor without a doubt. And I think in relation to Gilbert's wing, Ling's hypothesis, I think membrane fluidity ultimately matters a lot for his hypothesis to work. Um, and you can only have that with a certain mixture of different kinds of fats, different molecules, and to support it, you need different types of antioxidant-like molecules. So I think you're, not, you're dead on with your hypothesis on that. Appreciate it. Yeah. And it's also, I love the, I love the concept of structural antioxidants where it's like these things like vitamin E is just sitting there, vitamin C as well are just sitting there to um, almost, I mean, it's almost like to saturate the cell in, in a sense, right? So yeah, it basically acts like if a bridge, if you if you had a bridge that had any kind of damage or rusting or oxidation, vitamin E and vitamin C would be those molecules that essentially rebuild the bridge immediately so that no damage occurs in the future. And it's more hardy a sense, it lasts longer. Without a doubt, they are supporting the cells in staying healthier overall and just improving tissue health because ultimately what a tissue is is a, a conglomerate of the same kinds of cells. So should we combine a protein carbon fat at a meal? <sighs> I guess the the way to look at it is, is there any reason not to? Because um, I could understand for some people, maybe they have no gallbladder. And so if they incorporate protein, carbs, and fats into a meal, they won't digest it effectively because the fat stimulate bile release, except they're not producing as much. However, for the average individual, no issues whatsoever. I think it's a really good combination. It slows absorption rate. It improves absorption of many different compounds and the synergies between the different um, macronutrients can really help with utilization of those macronutrients. For example, if you have proteins and carbs versus just carbs alone, you're going to have a slower absorption of the carbs in general, reduces spiking of blood sugar, improves hormone physiology, and at the same time, improves shuttle to muscle fiber so that you can train better, essentially. But sugars versus starches then? I am a big fan of sugars versus starches because of the um, different fibers that you find in starches, even though the fibers are really good for things like heavy metals or things like uh, plastics and genoestrogens, really good for that. This is the fibers None that are in starches? For example, potatoes. In fact, one of the uh, sugar-like molecules that acts as a fiber in potato is used clinically for heavy metal toxicity. Really? What do you know what the name <laughs> of it is? Beta cyclodextrin. Wow. That's also funny. We're talking about the supplements as uh you know, people buy cyclodextrin and at the store. That's insane. So so why do you prefer sugars then? Mostly because of um less gut issues for most people. Uh, the fiber still contributes to gut issues for a lot of people. Um, the sugars are really quick in absorption rate and also shuttling to muscle fibers brain. And personally, I see a noticeable effect in cognitive performance, particularly with uh, simple sugars from fruits, for example, than I do with uh, white rice or if I were to eat a potato as part of my meal. Um, and so I really like that effect and I'm more fructose dominant than I am starch dominant. In addition to that, you also have a lot of anti, I mean, uh, you don't have a lot of anti-nutrients in a lot of uh, fruits. That's one of the reasons why fruits are so useful for people, um, especially in, like, in the animal-based community. And then the other thing is a lot of anti-estrogenic compounds come from fruits. So mm. I get the most bang for my buck through that. I did not know that. So I'm going to ask you a one-two punch here. Um, so 
Jay Feldman, I don't know if he made this term up, but I really like it. He referred to a lot of the polysaccharides that are in fruit as selective antimicrobials. Um, and the, they said that he doesn't really think they have a huge effect. I don't know. I don't want to take his words out of his mouth. He thinks most of their benefits are from the effect they're having on the gut, I believe. And you were saying about the potatoes, the, the use in heavy metal toxicities. Um, what I'm curious in both aspects of what your thoughts are, are these things mostly having an impact on the gut? Like how, because isn't mostly the heavy metals being stored in your tissues? How would the... Let me make sure I understand your question correctly. So are essentially the fibers from the starchy vegetables having the same effect as what Jay Feldman's idea is from the fruit um, fibers? Uh, more so saying like, um, do you think most of their benefits are coming from the things that are happening in the gut? Gotcha. In terms of the fibers in specific? Yeah, the polysaccharides, the flavonoids, the polysaccharides, mm -hmm. and like the, the what you said with the heavy metal for the potatoes. I would have said yes to you had I not learned about um, senolytics. I don't know if you heard of what senolytics, uh, anti-senescence molecules, essentially. And so senescent cells are old damaged cells and they don't contribute anything to your, your health. In fact, they worsen it, tend to promote cancer and so on. Most fruits contain a ton of senolytic compounds. And so they kill senescent cells. Mm. And the only way that that's going to happen is if it gets absorbed, transported to those cells or immune cells in particular in the first place. So I'm sure that there's gut specific um, effects with polyphenols really does support the microbiome with flavonoids, which are part of polyphenolic compounds. But then there's also the senolytic effects and I'm sure other effects that we probably haven't even characterized that can only happen if it gets absorbed and transported somewhere where those cells are. Makes sense. Thank you for correcting me. I always say polysaccharides. I, I meant polyphenols. Gotcha. Um, um, and for those listeners, that, those are like the antioxidants, the flat, the special things that everyone talks about. They're all the rage and like blueberries and the well, anthocyanins, I believe are one of them. Um, there's a number of very beneficial ones. Um, and they seem, they're very beneficial. It's probably one of the most beneficial parts besides the actual energy components of fruit. Uh, so with starches, you always combine them with some kind of saturated fat for the endotoxin effect for it to minimize? I don't even think like, uh, um, so I'm assuming this is in relation to like saturated fats increase endotoxin load. Is that the, I thought it was just starch. Well, I thought the saturated fats actually had a protective effect of the starches for endotoxin. I've, so this is funny because I heard the, in the vegan community, this mm -hmm. is what they argue that saturated fat increases endotoxin absorption. And then I've never heard this one of starch promoting this. So, yeah, I bet you that mostly when it comes to endotoxin, it depends on the person's baseline gut health. Because if their gut health is already not a good um, hospitable place, a lot of bad bacteria and a lot of inflammation going on, no matter the food, it's going to absorb, it's going to cause absorption mm -hmm. of endotoxin. So maybe, yeah, maybe I phrase this, I definitely phrase this poorly. I think the saturated fat slows the absorption of, and the digestion of the starches so that it increases their digestion. So less makes it to the bacteria where that's fermented. And then if you don't, you know, if you eat a ton of uh, hard to digest starches, they're just going to rapidly ferment. And then that will cause an increase in their toxin. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I think it could happen also in general from uh, quick digestive uh, carbs, if you have a lot of bacteria in the intestines, in the upper intestines, so the small intestines in particular. But I'm not quite sure. I haven't looked in particular on mm. if saturated fats help with this or not. I personally have never had a bad side effect from combining a fatty. For example, if I mix mashed potatoes with butter, it doesn't do anything. I feel great with it. So, um, so I was listening to a podcast. Uh, you know, more plates, more dates. Yeah, yeah. Derek uh, and he had Alex from on. And they were talking about uh, how after like uh, Alex Ramosi, he's currently on TRT, but he's just spent 20 years building a phenomenal physique. Derek is on TRT, I believe as well. And they said, he's like, I feel horrible after I work out. And he's like, I, I like people, I'm trying to work out as little as I possibly can because I can't, I don't function. I can't, I'm not as, don't have the same capacity to get work done or, or the same, you know, vigor to get work done. And I was just kind of curious in your thoughts on that because I personally thought, a could be from the gut issues. And I also think like when you have a super physiological amount of A testosterone, but B muscle mass, it's like everyone gets some sort of leaky gut from muscle, from work lifting. But when you have 10 times the amount of muscle mass that you should, you're probably gonna get a significant, even more reduction in uh, your gut health. But so I thought it could be from the histamine response and also maybe not eating very quality foods after your workout. So what do you, what do, you do to, wh when do you time your workouts and what do you eat before and after generally to keep yourself zooming? 
So this is in particular with Derek, right? He mentioned that he gets side effects um, from working out hard, and so he doesn't do it as often anymore. I th- yeah, that that okay. uh, post exercise malaise in general. That's a strong sign that a lot of things are probably going wrong. That he might be burning himself out. He's a very big fan of keto diets and for cognitive performance. Performance, but if he at times, even if it's cyclic keto, he might already be in a higher cortisol-like state. And as a consequence, working out takes it up just that extra notch that makes it a negative effect overall in your health. And then that worsens your gut health. And then if he's having food that's already damaging to the gut, boom, it's even higher now, the amount of cortisol. So that could be what's going on with him. Um, in terms of how I structure my workouts, um, I like to work out between 12 to 3 p.m., so afternoon time. However, it's not always possible with my schedule. Most of the time I have to get it in first thing in the morning, but I don't go as crazy as I used to. I'm a big fan of lifting hard, lifting heavy, high intensity training style. Um, but I've realized with the things that I'm trying to do, that's not conducive. That's not helpful for my studies. For example, I need to maintain enough energy so that I can devote time to those things as well. Mm. Um, otherwise my nervous system is, is also wrecked. If I do like a PR deadlift every single time I go to the gym. If I do, for example, Grego Gallagher's kind of workouts where it's Dark three times a week. High, yeah, exactly. That'll still be enough to cause me, cause a reduction in my cognitive um, performance with calculations and stuff. So I don't go as hard now. I'm more bodybuilding oriented. I try to focus on improving my physique more than anything. I've had my days where it's mostly powerlifting oriented, strongman training, and I still do incorporate those, but probably once a week at, at mm-hmm. most. Yeah, I can definitely relate. I've I feel pretty good right now with my workouts. I'm also working out late at night, not late at night, but uh, around after work, five or six, which I think as long as I don't work out too late, because it'll keep me up sometimes. Um, I don't feel too stressed out. But uh, last year I would hit, like, I would go in the midday around 12. And I mean, it's really hard to go back from like a heavy set of hack squats to like, all right, let me just go work on this chemistry. Like it's just, uh, you're amped up and it's hard to just sit down and be chill again. I agree. That's exactly the feeling. Um, do you have a general macronutrient ratio you like to, to recommend? On active days, I'm hitting no less than like 300 grams of carbs. On non-active days, it goes down to about 250 grams, 200 grams. And on active days, I'm hitting about 180 grams of protein, roughly 160 to 190, I'd say is like the range. And then on non-active days, I'm about 130 to 170, depending on what I decide to eat. Um, that's all I focus on. And then the fats, I just get however many fats I want. Mm-hmm. I don't really count calories. I don't really count macros. I've done it already many times. And that's how I can eyeball these things in the range that I'm in. That's pretty much how I go about it. I think everyone should count calories for a period just so they have a, you know, they can eyeball it as like, I don't, I haven't counted calories for years, but I know give or take so every once in a while, I'll do a day where I'll like, I'll track calories. I don't weigh anything, but just so I have a general ballpark of my, like, oh yeah, that checks out. Um, yeah, because you have no idea unless you've done it before a little bit. Yep. That's how I see it too. Um, so do you count collagen towards your protein intake? Yeah, I, I do. I think that because collagen is richer in glycine, proline and other specific, um, amino acids that you're, you're only going to find in higher amounts in collagen versus muscle meats. I think that people should still prioritize collagen as part of their protein intake. What about for muscle, like specifically for muscle growth? If it's, let's say I'm trying to gain as even, well. yeah, even for that. I mean, people don't f- seem to remember at times what surrounds your muscle fibers is a bunch of fascia. And if the fascia is not healthy or if your ligaments aren't healthy and they're not contracting as effectively because of ligament tears and damage, um, tendon tears and damage, you're going to need a higher amount of collagen in the first place to have hypertrophy growth, uh, hypertrophy in general. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about like meal timing, I guess. Um, so our most, ins- so the way I like to think of insulin sensitivity and explain it to people is that it's kind of like your cell's gas tank. When you're very insulin sensitive, it's like your cells are really hungry. They want a lot of fuel and they were very unlikely or less likely to convert it into fat as storage. Um, they're probably just likely to store it as glu- as gl- glycogen, um, but yeah. less likely to store, like, convert it into another form. They really want that sugar. Um, yeah. So generally our most insulin sensitive times are post-workout and in the morning. So what I've advised to people is to, if you're going, when you're going to consume starches, especially if you're trying to lose weight or maintain to consume your starchiest meals in the morning or after a workout. Do you think that's like a sound advice or do you- 
yeah, I, I, I naturally do this without even thinking about it, essentially what you just mentioned. And I guess it's because that's when I crave carbs the most as well. Obviously you just worked out, your body's going to want some sugar to replenish the glycogen in the first place. But then yeah, the other added effect is you also have increased production of glucose transporters and so on, and not just insulin. Um, so your cells get super sensitive and they, the mitochondria is going to u- utilize all of that glucose effectively for its own purposes of energy production. And I think that's just the smartest way to go about with orienting carbohydrates. Um, if you're consuming a lot in the first place. So I would say a lot for me would be over 350 grams of carbs. I'm not going to consume over 350 grams of carbs while I'm just doing schoolwork. I'm going to do it after I hit the gym. And then going off that, how do you feel about, so I recently started doing the car- Ray P carrot salad. I've been eating a carrot for the years. I was just like, I'm not making a freaking salad. I've never eaten salad in my life. Now I'm like, damn, the salad's actually really good. Tastes really good. <laughs> but <laughs> the uh, the vinegar um, seems to spike the, decrease the spike of insulin. Do you think that can have a a direct effect on decreasing fat synthesis? Yeah, I see what you're saying because this insulin will drive more fat, um, higher fat accumulation of fat cells. Um, I know from studies on vinegar that what it essentially does is it reduces circulating levels of fats and glucose in the first place. And it also promotes the um, absorption of glucose effectively into cells. And so that also plays into the lower circulation in general. That's how it drops blood sugar essentially. Mm. Um, I think that nothing but good, good effects could come from this positive effects in general. So if you're, able to break down substrates better, your cells are not going to send signals that it's starving, like, you know, uh, higher ghrelin levels. And so then you start consuming more and then fat accumulation goes up and also an insulin signaling goes up. So yeah, in my opinion, using vinegar for a reduction of that will ultimately contribute to lower fat synthesis. Wow. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. It's interesting that acetic acid too. I was really surprised because I looked in the calories. I was like, oh, it doesn't have any calories. Why? Do you know why that is? with acetic acid because that's what vinegar is right Mm -hmm. yeah mostly acetic acid but in terms of like why it doesn't count as calories or why the effects come from acetic acid uh well i was asking towards why it doesn't count as calories but if you want to answer both i'd love to hear it (laughs) yeah i mean i I would agree with you that acetic acid should count as some calories um i'm assuming it's because of the serving size acetic acid is essentially the last product in cells from glucose or from fats um so it's it's car i mean uh it's a macronutrient in a sense, the same way glucose or fats are a macronutrient. I'm not sure in terms of like the calories, but in terms of the positive effects, it seems to be that it helps with transporting um, macromolecules into cells better. Like acetyl L-carnitine is acetic acid plus carnitine, and it helps bring that inside of cells a lot better. I did not know any of that. That is, I thought it was just an acetyl group added towards carnitine. Yeah, basically, yeah, acetyl acetic acid is essentially the same molecule with one less hydrogen. That's fascinating. I have, this is what makes me, I have a huge organic chemistry textbook sitting in my home and I'm like, I hated organic chemistry, barely passed it. And now I'm just like, dude, I love it now. It's, it's insane. <laughs> and when, and when you have these applications, it's like, yeah. oh, this isn't like this mumbo jumbo. I, the, I passed with like a 46 on organic chemistry. Wow. Yeah. Something like that. It's like, dude, how, like, I understand it's a weed out class. Like everyone was pre-med, but, and it's so much harder to learn for me, at least when you don't have anything to like remember it or apply it to, it's just all these arbitrary rules that are occurring. That is exactly what's wrong with school, man. It's the fact that you have these incredible scientists and they don't explain to you why it's important in the first place. I also think they kind of don't understand either. Not that like they, like I'm not saying they're dumb in any way, but like they don't have the paradigm where it's like this has application towards nutrition. Yeah, that's a good point. But yeah, that's uh, one of the reasons I would uh, do some com- combination. Do you have any suggestions? Like if you were to just like go back to school for not for your career, but just kind of learn more about the bioenergetics like world. Yeah, nutrition in particular, I would definitely say go for cell biology, molecular biology or plant biology. And funny enough, plant biology probably translate the most. Um, that's one thing most people wouldn't even focus on. That's crazy. What about uh, like physics and chemistry? You kind of stay towards the biology side. I wouldn't pursue chemistry unless you were really interested in uh, how, for example, medicines are made or nutraceuticals are are made and formulated and why they work, uh, what you can expect expect with certain compounds prediction-wise, like should this compound have an anti-estrogenic effect? That's mostly what chemistry is useful for. Otherwise, for the actual um, consequences, you want to focus on biology. Okay. How do these molecules play into health systems? 
And then for physics, I would only do it if you're really interested in the more biophysics approach, because otherwise you're going to go more of like a material science engineer um, okay. route. So you kind of like try and learn the chemistry and physics you need on the side a little bit, or maybe like take exactly to, su to support the biology. And, and most people that would do plant biology, most people that would do cell or molecular biology, they're going to have to do the baseline organic chemistry in the first place. That's why I love your work and like Georgie's work, especially um, those are the two names that come to the top of my head. And I also like Dr. Dr. Todd Panzer. We talked about him, um, but you guys have this base and I do too. And I'm not trying to put my work on your level, but have this baseline understanding of chemistry where it's like, this is in physics as well. And it's like, if you don't have this like understanding of like why these like polyunsaturated, it's to me, it's like polyunsaturated fats. When someone says they're unstable, it's like, it's a very simple argument why they're unstable, why they're more likely to be peroxidized. And I can understand like the, you know, the mainstream view of why they're beneficial. Like I, I, um, I can understand that, but if you don't have this chemistry view of like what's going on in the cell, it's really hard for me to really value your understanding of what's going on without that. That's one thing I see a lack of in the communication between the PUFA group and the saturated fat group. A lot of people that support PUFAs that are vegan, they essentially bring the clinical studies and they say, well, we don't have a side effect here, so it's good for you. Then the saturated fat group brings their uh, mechanistic evaluations like, well, it's unstable and it oxidizes. But if they just thought about it from a little bit deeper perspective of chemistry in the first place, unsaturated molecules are the first to react because of pi bonds and it's literally used in industry for this exact reason. It's what allows creation of a total uh, class of uh, different petrochemicals in the first place. Um, that is enough to warrant an investigation into probably reducing PUFAs because of this simple fact. But as soon as you bring it up to like the, the PUFA group, they don't understand that because they never really focus on chemistry. I found that most of the people that focus on clinical studies just have not cared enough about the chemistry to actually understand it. Yeah, I've watched you, uh, uh, seen you in some comment section debates with, uh, we won't name names, but, uh, and it was interesting. I'm like, wow, this is just like, I think it's very fascinating to read. This is very out of my league. I hope to get there one day when I can contribute. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, what do you think of the, so the main benefits, quote unquote, of the vegetable oils, right? So the anti-inflammatory aspect um, is partially the, correct me if I'm wrong. So the blood lowering or the, Lipid lowering aspect is from kind of the liver being decreased in efficiency from the vegetable oils, I believe. The anti-inflammatory effect, I believe, is from the eicosanoids, which are breakdown products of the PUFAs. And partially, potentially, when you slam the omega-3s, just the increasing the ratio of the omega-3 to omega-6, um, I think it's a very bad way to go about increasing the ratio. But because the omega-6s are very inflammatory, the having more omega-3s relative to it makes it seem less inflammatory. I can that's reiterate a, that's that. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's exactly. Yeah. Can you reiterate, reiterate the first point? Um, the first point was that, oh, so th I believe this is from Jay and Mike that we were talking to them, um, that they believe that the vegetable oils going into the liver her, um, caused an increase decrease in efficiency of the liver was able to export fat, which is why you see the cholesterol and the serum sugar slide. Low, exactly. Low yep. That's exactly right. It, it also reduces the amount of mRNA transcripts of fats in general, like the production of fats and cholesterol and so on. So the body doesn't produce as much cholesterol in the first place. The body doesn't produce as much lipoproteins in the first place. So it's a pseudo effect. These fats reduce LDL, they reduce cholesterol, but it doesn't make it any less pathogenic. It just lowers the amount. Does that make sense? Can it's like the same thing with time. plastics. So essentially what it, what it's doing is it's going inside of the cell and it's telling the cell, Hey, we're going to cut down production of cholesterol. And we're also going to cut down production of LDL. Now you don't produce as much. Okay, cool. But it still doesn't change the patho mm. that pathology of heart disease okay. in the first place, but it looks like that essentially. It's like, Oh, you, you still have plastic coming in your food, but it's a little bit less. <laughs> yeah. I, I saw something that was really interesting. It's like, you can't have heart disease without having oxidized cholesterol. Yeah. Then now they're, they're trying to essentially counteract this by saying it's not just the oxidation it's the total amount that's circulating in the first place. And I'm like, my brother in Christ, <laughs> heart disease only develops if it damages the endothelium. It doesn't even matter how much is circulating. It's what matters happens inside of the cells. Yeah. So in my opinion, like the best way to <laughs> let's not say lower cholesterol, but to have healthy cholesterol is to uptake right. it efficiently. Right. Which is going to be dependent on thyroid hormone because you don't want it sitting there for a long time. 
and stability of of cells matter a lot. Stability of even LDL, uh, the lipoprotein matters. If you have a lot of unstable fats and low antioxidants, guess what? You're going to make oxysterol. And oxysterol is the contributor to cardiovascular disease among the oxidized PUFAs as well. But um, that only happens if you have a high amount of PUFA, low antioxidants in the first place. So yeah, that matters a lot. Mm-hmm. Baseline health drives a lot of the pathologies associated with these molecules. Inherently, these are not bad molecules. Some can be more reactive, like the PUFAs. Some can be more stable, like the vitamin E. But essentially, they don't do anything in the context of just the molecules themselves. The person and their baseline health matters a lot in this. Mm-hmm. And so do you think the main issue with the PUFAs in the cell is their instability, which, you know, I like to say oxidative stress is like if you imagine your cell like a game of pinball and there are just balls bouncing around, it hits the saturated fat, bounces off, hits the polyunsaturated fat, you know, it breaks the bond and that causes these, inf- you know, these yeah. free radicals um, to be released. Is the is it fine to be burning the PUFAs though? It's just the issue is that when they get peroxidation, when those pinballs hit it and the yeah, so mediators, I, I, to mediators. I see what you're saying. The, the problem comes in understanding how they're burned. Um, so when we think of burning fats, we literally think of the same process as oxidation of fats. It's entirely different. The burning of fats that happens inside of mitochondria, and that's the only place you're going to burn it is in mitochondria, um, is essentially you have a long chain fat. It gets broken down and chopped into smaller and smaller pieces that essentially makes acetic acid. That's the acetyl- acetyl- acetyl-CoA, right? Exactly. Okay. That's it. So it's not actually burning it. It's just utilizing chopped up portions of the fats to help with electron transport. That's literally all it's doing. The, and that's in the mitochondria? Yeah. So what's is that? So you're saying that's how we oxidize fats? That's beta oxidation? Exactly. That, and, mm-hmm, exactly. In the mitochondria matrix, you need L-carnitine for that. And uh, all fats go through the same process, except PUFAs have some added process. They have to first become saturated um, for the chain to actually be broken up effectively. And is that detrimental? No, not, there's no detriment in specific to it. Like I can't think of a negative consequence to this process. It takes longer. However, if the PUFA is inherently unstable and the mitochondria is already producing reactive oxygen species, we all know mitochondria produces some ROS. Mm -hmm. If that comes into contact with the PUFA, that's not going to get oxidized anymore. Now you have a um, peroxyl radical and Uh, that's going to contribute to mitochondrial damage. Interesting. Interesting. So the, the inflammatory mediators of the omega-6, like malondaldehyde and the omega-3s, um, that is mostly from the peroxidation and when these things, so I know, I believe malondaldehyde is literally, excuse me, it only comes in the omega-3s and I believe it's an epoxide, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I think it's a, it's an aldehyde. Oh, that's why they, oh yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Um, mm-hmm. But that's the, cause I know, I think it's similarly structural. I don't know why I thought it was an epoxide, but I thought it was similarly structurally. Cause I know we talked about in my organic chemistry class that epoxides just wreak havoc on the cell. They're just so hard to break apart. Um, and that's why I thought myelondaldehyde cause it's so stable, but it's so inflammatory is so detrimental. Yeah. It's, it's it, um, I can't think of, um, what the other one, I think it's glyoxylate if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember exactly, but essentially these aldehydes, what they do is they promote the fat oxidation of PUFAs in the, in, when I say oxidation here, I don't mean in mitochondria, I mean the bad way. And what they make as a consequence are epoxides. And that oh, okay. in itself, that in itself can produce more melondialdehyde or those epoxidated PUFAs can go inside of the nucleus and form adducts with DNA. It acts like a heat seeking missile that causes DNA adducts. This is the same exact mechanism word for word that happens with um, tobacco uh, and cigarette smoke that causes lung cancer. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that if PUFAs are doing what tobacco smoke does to mm-hmm. cause cancer, well, how can anybody deny that it's carcinogenic or detrimental to the cells? That's interesting. Is the main um, carcinogen, in, and not carcinogen, but like, is it malondaldehyde actively involved in tobacco as well? It's Acrylane one of them, too, right? Acrylane is another one. What the one that I'm talking about in specific are phenanthrene epoxides. And so it's like the cholesterol molecule. Um, phenanthrenes are basically, it looks exactly like the cholesterol ring. So it has a couple of rings together. And instead of hydrogen atoms, what you have is epoxide groups all around the molecule. And so it acts like a heat seeking missile. Oh my it goes God. straight, it goes straight to DNA and then it lodges itself in between the strands of DNA. And so you can't read DNA effectively it becomes essentially a mutagen. 
Um, and then that causes carcinogenesis. Likewise, with PUFAs, a similar thing occurs. Okay. So I had a nerd out moment when you described the, like the epoxides around them. Yeah. Just <laughs> bad. Um, yeah. So when you, what do you mean by DNA adducts? As you saying the mut- mutated DNA, or are you saying specifically something else? Pure. So it's completely normal DNA until this molecule comes in and wrecks it apart. And the way that it wrecks it is by forming a bridge between the two strands where it shouldn't. And that's what you call an adduct essentially, where you glue two molecules together that shouldn't be glued. Interesting. And that is going to prevent, that's what you said is prevents the reading of the DNA. Yeah, essentially DNA can't have anything in between it. Otherwise it's not going to be read properly. And if it does, it's going to make completely unstable, inaccurate proteins. And then that causes cancer. That is very fascinating. So do you tend to reside more on this? Well, I think you're going to be in between, but I'm going to ask you the same question anyway. Um, on this genetic side of cancer, where it's like um, the DNA damage or the m- more nu- repeat nutrition bioenergetics, or do you think that this increase, the decreased efficiency in the mitochondria is causing more reactive oxygen, reactive oxygen species to develop these free radicals, which is causing the DNA damage, which causes the genetic I believe that there are certain cancers that are single gene conditions, but they are very rare. And I don't actually, I don't even want to say they're very rare. They're rare. And these single gene based cancers can't be fixed with normal therapies. You can't help the mitochondria and get it better. You can't help the person with nutrition and get them better. You have to literally do gene therapy. That is the only way to fix them. But most cancers are indeed driven by lifestyle and environment nutrition. And those are the cancers where people should focus on how to improve mitochondrial health, how to improve uh, um, cell metabolism, how to reduce cancer metabolites using uh, anti-carcinogenic compounds, Mm -hmm. anti-mutagens. That's all where they become super useful. But then those rare group of patients that you try to implement that will have no effect whatsoever. Reminds me of a point that will transition us to our next question. Uh, I was listening to this guy on Joe Rogan. He's the owner of White Oak Pastures. I forget what his name is. Um, Yeah. But he was talking, talking about, about, he was talking about how uh, he believes the cows that are going off in these grain fed, um, grain finished farms, they, you know, they start feeding them grain around six months and they live to about 18 months and they have a weight. I think that's like 300 to 500 pounds more than the grass fed. He's like, oh, so the grass fed, they kill around two years. So I don't think if you just let the grain fed cows live for another year, I don't think they would survive. That's a good point. I have never even considered, um, the lifespan, considering that they, what, when do they usually kill them? It's like a six months to a year and a six and six months in. Uh, so like I believe they start feeding them green and six months in, I believe they kill them around 16 to 18 months versus grass fed. He was saying is two years, which isn't that crazy of a difference. I would have thought it would have been more of a difference, but he said the regular lifespan of a cattle is like 20 years. If you feed them. And I guess that's also assuming like that you might be able to reverse some of the damage going back to a grass fed diet. But if you, he said, I thought that was really interesting. It's like, you're pretty much eating a dying cow when you're eating these grain fed, which is. That, that is a beautiful way to state it. And if you think about it from a lifespan perspective, as humans, let's say that we live on average 80 years. Then if you did 20 years of horrible dieting, that's still reversible, maybe within like five years or so. For a cow, 20 years means that if it's going to die within two years, irreversible. I mean, there's not much you can do. If you try, if you go a year and a half and it's eating grains and then you decide, okay, let's make this cow eat grass fed. It'll probably live to three, four years old mm. out of 20 years. So it's like, there's not much you can do there because of a short lifespan. Humans have a lot more of a, an ability to repair and recover until they get older. Because of our, you think that's part of longer. Like the okay, yeah. lifespan. Interesting. Um, so this is a random question uh, that I just thought of. Uh, my friend, Bren, who works at uh, Umzu with us, he had some, so he, he had some chickens that lay eggs and he took them to the butcher and says, has, can you make, can you butcher these for me? And he says, these, but these were egg laying chickens. Like you want to butcher? He's like, yeah, I want to butcher. I'm not going to waste the meat. And then Bren understood why that he didn't eat the chickens. Apparently when you eat the older chickens, it could also have something to do with the hormones from the egg laying. Um, it is just the worst meat possible. Like, it's just like, uh, he said he couldn't even get it down. I think he made it into a stew and like, he still like barely get down. Any thoughts on like what's happening there is just the aging of like the proteins and poofas maybe. Wow. I mean, I've never had that kind of chicken um, experience before. Um, let's think about it from a first principles perspective. So the chicken was how old? Uh, like pro- probably like seven or eight years old. I think it's because they don't eat these. Like it's usually you have chicken that dies a year. Probably. I could imagine that hormones have a large role to play with, uh, the taste of food. For example, 
chickens that are really fat, uh, they're going to be tastier, but you also get chickens fatter with a lot of estrogen. You pump them up full of estrogen. I think that could contribute to how the taste have, um, how the t- essentially the chickens taste in the first place. And as they get older, hormone physiology changes. The meat might get um, totally different in terms of the proteins that are produced, um, how they're structured in terms of like a tissue organization. And then as a consequence, the taste changes as well. And in general, if you think about it from like the evolution side of taste, as we talked about in the beginning, older things don't necessarily taste better. Uh, a banana that just became ripe is a lot better than a banana that's fully brown. Likewise, for many other foods, it's like the older the food is, the worse it's going to taste in the first place. Yeah, it's very interesting. Good point. Um, going off that, do you think it's important? How important or big of a role do you think hormones in animals play in terms of the cows and all that stuff, eating them? And even milk, I guess. I know milk, milk is typically a very small amount, but... Um, it's in a, in terms of like a health context or taste context, uh, more so health. Okay. Uh, I definitely think that the estrogen content of meat and dairy products, if they're grown on like a grain fed diet is a little bit of a concern. And I've noticed that with myself, it's like, I can drink the same milk. Um, but if it's one that's grain fed versus grass fed, I might notice a couple more acne spots come up in my skin. And I can't think of anything that's different other than the milk. So I have to assume it's the estrogen, the content inside of the grain fed milk. And in that case, I think it really does matter. Interesting. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, and so ruminants, it's a little bit different because they have the rumen, which, you know, hydrogenates and does, you know, it's pretty much a magic machine in terms of converting food to other things. But specifically from where pork and chicken. I know that uh, Ray has talked about their inflammatory amino acids that have been high in tryptophan, cysteine, methionine, uh, which you might not disagree with entirely. I know we need some of them, but too much. Do you think that having these pastured raised pork and chicken um, where they're getting more, you know, gelatin and more natural source of food, would that change their amino acid content? It does without a doubt. In my opinion, it's so much better. Um, especially with the stability of the proteins. Again, like the amount of antioxidants they get in, in their diet plays a role in how the proteins interact with other molecules. And so their proteins can cross link a lot less than one that's not raised on a regenerative farm, for example. And then uh, just a couple other uh, random questions. If you, if you have time, I don't know if you have. Absolutely. Sure. Good. Awesome. No rush. Um, favorite. So favorite new tropics. And, and now I don't mean like I would say natural nootropics, like things that you use. I know you use niacin and I, I'm curious. I was talking to some people about it yesterday um, and I was just curious. I, I know it's against that. Like it is, you're inducing a stress response and you're just using it as a tool pretty much, right? Is in your perspective. Yeah. Um, the expanding on the niacin first. Um, yeah. You're going to increase a little bit of stress for 20 minutes, 30 minutes. The consequence for 10 to 15 hours later are undeniable. In my opinion, you feel a lot better. Your energy's um, elevated, you, your skin looks a lot brighter and I'm more than positive that has to do with capillaries essentially opening up and more blood flow coming into the area and your brain is on more glucose gets transported into the, the brain and oxidized appropriately because B3 is there to support the proper use of glucose in the first place. I feel incredible after taking niacin versus taking niacinamide. I do not get the same benefits from niacinamide that I do from niacin but it's still useful. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that in my experience, I love the way I feel in niacin. Um, so 30 minutes of stress for 15 hours of improvements in mm-hmm. cognition and performance, I'll take it. For sure. Do you, and then in terms of... Sorry, do you feel bad in, during the 30 minutes or you feel just no, kind of red? I, sometimes I don't even flush anymore. It's like it, the, what, the flushing depend. Yeah, the floosh depends <laughs> on <laughs> depends on the amount of uh, free fatty acids in the blood in the first place. If you don't have a lot, you're not going to flush. Huh. I'm going to try, I'm going to try the floosh. I'm going to, I'll let you know. I'm sending a picture of my red ass face for you. That's interesting. <laughs> I, I got really red as a kid all the time and I, I never knew what it was from. And it's interesting that you talk about that has to do with, uh, the amino acids, free fats. Free fatty acids. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, there's other mechanisms at play, but the most important one is how much of the free fats are circulating. Otherwise, um, the only other two mechanisms is through histamine, which I don't feel anything sometimes. Um, and then through G protein couple receptors, which has to do with people's genetics as well. So mostly it has to do with the fats. Gotcha. And I forgot niacin and niacinamide both have a free fatty acid lowering effect, right? Yeah. Essentially doing what these cholesterol drugs do. Gotcha. All right. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Nootropics. Yeah. So 
nicotine and caffeine by far. You can't beat those two. And you've probably seen my story with that. Um, it's not, I'm not saying go smoke tobacco. I'm not saying go smoke a vape or whatever. I'm just saying in my experience, I have tried alpha GPC. I have tried phenylparacetam. I've tried new pepto. I've tried uh, modafinil, adrafinil, all kinds of nootropics and combinations therein. I've looked at synergies and how their chemistry um, plays along. I have never felt something come as close to doing nicotine and caffeine together. Do you, you ever tried nicotine with caffeine, uh, methylene blue? I haven't. That that might be something to try. How do you feel? Uh, I so I, I don't handle nicotine. How do you like to get your nicotine in? Uh, to smoke it. Smoke Just it? tobacco smoke. Okay. Yeah. Cigar I, or pipe. Gotcha. I've been on the uh, uh, the Zen wave. I don't know how you feel about that. Um, you, you can we'll talk about that after. But uh, I, yeah, I feel like well, I know one of the main detriments with nicotine is the nitric oxide, and methylene blue is such a potent nitric oxide inhibitor. So I feel like it counteracts the jittery effects a little bit. And I just like, I don't really feel a crash. So I feel very smooth with it. It d- definitely feel, uh, you'll have to let me know if you think, but um, what do you think about that? That that could, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I can see how that would help, especially with uh, the carcinogenic compounds that come from smoking tobacco or the way that nicotine itself from Zinn um, can stimulate the nervous system in a, in a stressful way. Um, methylene blue should help in general with not only the jitteriness, but also breaking down the compound effectively. So less people, less concentration of nicotine overall yeah. over the period of its half life. Yeah. So I'll do like, like four drops of methylene and I don't do nicotine every day. I'll just do it when I'm working. Um, so I don't try, I don't want to take methylene blue every day either. Um, not that, ever, you know, methylene blue is a drug, be safe, <laughs> be careful. <laughs> um, and I, I know you've talked about that extensively. Um, do you think I would really like, I would love to see if I could get a nicotine gum, like a, one of those like natural like gum from the tree not from the tree, but like, I know they had like, that's how they used to do it. They used to chew. Um, the resin of yeah. nicotine essentially. Yeah. Uh, oh, where I think that the Peruvian cultures did that where they took cocoa leaves and they, they chewed it. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've seen that. My roommate went to Peru for it to see the, um, what Machu, is the map? Picchu. Machu Picchu and they give you cocoa leaves because it helps you adapt to the altitude, mm-hmm. which is fascinating how it happens in the first place. I can't imagine insane i mean how they yeah. also figure that out and just say hey, chew these here's some yeah, little yeah. Bit of coke um <laughs> <laughs> uh any so yeah nicotine caffeine anything else you like to do i like sugar dude. Uh, i think sugar keeps me yeah going. i mean here's how i know for a fact that you don't need a lot of crazy nootropics first of all how do nootropics work what inevitably all nootropics do is either they increase growth factors in the brain or they increase metabolism that's it. If you have somebody that's like hypothyroid, it doesn't matter how much paracetam or other compounds you give them, they're not going to see as drastic an effect versus somebody who has a healthy metabolism. That's how most of these compounds are working. And I figured most of that out when I first did biochemistry, because that's when I started taking niacin, niacinamide together, 500 milligrams of each, caffeine, um, a protein and carb rich meal in the morning, and my brain was on, I, I passed biochem and biochem two with literally 99 out of hundred weighted average. That's incredible. That was when my, when my brain turned on the, the difference was night and day compared to before. And before was when I was cycling through all these different compounds from nootropics depot. And I have not had as great an effect, um, versus just eating a good meal with caffeine and something that supports blood sugar oxidation. Um, and essentially make sure, making sure you have carbohydrates as well coming in. In my opinion, you're absolutely right. The sugar plus the stimulants that increase metabolism essentially make your brain op- operate at its maximum. I was talking when I was talking to these kids about niacin yesterday. They were talking about the floosh. Um, and the one woman thought it, her his girlfriend thought it was an allergic reaction, which I thought was funny. But it's hard for me to talk to people about supplements because people are like, dude, what should I take? I want to be healthy. Or it's like, like, why should I take niacin? And I'm like, dude, me telling you that it's going to increase glucose oxidation and lower free fatty acids will probably mean nothing to you. Who like It's hard to, because it's not like, I guess you can just give a more, it's hard to give more general. It's like, oh, it increases energy production. Um, but that's kind of like a, a bogus answer. I don't know. It's, it's tough because you want to be as contextualized as possible. But you also like, if I tell them, it's like, oh, it decreases free fatty acids. They're like, what, like, why? Why does that matter? <laughs> That is exactly my experience with most people. Um, that's why on my page, I, I really try to make an emphasis in understanding and teaching. Like I teach people how to think, how to think, not just what to take, because 
if you don't understand the principles behind it, well, then you're going to have that same, how to, how to do this, how to fix that, how to improve that mentality. And you'll never know why it's happening in the first place. Like with the yeah. nootropics, the reason why it's happening is either growth factors or metabolism. That's it. Yeah. That's why I think uh, you have one of the best pages on Instagram. That a doubt. Appreciate that, man. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, definitely go check it out. It's, th- how do, I'm going to butcher it. <laughs> it's like next to- Thucydides. Yeah, through, yeah, if I can't say next to Timalization, don't worry about that name. Man. <laughs> hey, you call me <laughs> in a, we need to say next to Timalize, and I will, you you say it Thucydides. Um, yeah, Thucydides, Thucydides, the Greek scholar. How did you get that name? Or I know obviously I, uh, from him, but <laughs> I used to watch a lot of uh, Elliot Hulse back in the day when he was very popular, like 2014, 15. and I remember the quote that he had from Thucydides on the the. The scholar that never fights and the warrior that never reads will have its society. It's thinking done by fools and it's fighting done by cowards. And it's very true. I've heard uh, you that need to combine, I did not know yeah. that was for him. That's awesome. Yeah. You, you need to combine both mentalities to have a actualized effect on your endeavors. Like you can't just be um, aimless at life, but still you like force your way through life. You have to have a plan and you also have to have the willpower to, to get those things done. Combining the two philosophies is really important. Something that's come up time and time again in my life. Um, so I took that name and I made it my Instagram handle. That's awesome. I love that quote from Aristotle. I believe it's, I'm going to butcher it, but he is too, uh, he is only a scholar. It, it, I want to say it's too effeminate. He is only an, a, a, warrior. A, a warrior is, do you know what it is? Too vulgar. He's yeah. Too, I, I recall a little, little bit of that. Is it a true potential? I have it written down. I have a list of quotes that I uh, have written down, like quotes worth remembering. I think it's very worthwhile. I highly recommend it. Uh, but and then it's like the true man is like the scholar athlete, the one that is like a warrior. And like, like so you, you got to be able to think and you can't just be a meathead at the gym. Like it's, it's so, it's, it's important. That's why I love like, again, it's one of the reasons why I really respect you and your page. Cause it's like, I know you're putting work in the gym and I can relate to that. Like I was a meathead. The reason I got went down this nutrition pathway was because I wasn't gaining muscle. I was like, all right, let me look at my hormones, look at all this stuff. And now I actually like, I think lifting is relatively simple in muscle building. Like I think this stuff is much more fascinating. Um, so I focus a lot more on this, but I came into it as just a guy that wanted to, I, and I still lift weights and still put on muscle, but I think that is just less fun. <laughs> That's literally my journey too. That's how I found out about you guys and anabolicmen.com was 2015. I realized, wait a second, I'm actually not putting on weight. And I realized the importance of androgenic hormones and got into DHT and so on. And then I got enamored by all of the physiology stuff. Exactly. Yeah. I was, uh, yeah, it's crazy how it's been a long time. It's been a long time coming. I, no one had ever heard talked per, talked about hormones and their effect on like lifting other than like steroids. It's, it's um, all it's all calories, bro. Yeah. You just gotta have some calories. <laughs> and and fish oil, dude. Fish oil. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's crazy. Uh thoughts on lithium. I've been considering adding in. Oh, uh, sorry, I wanted to say one other thing. Uh when we talk about methylene blue, I tried it like a year ago and I didn't feel any effects. And I think that speaks to what you were talking about, how your physiology changes as like you're better able to handle sugar and like certain things that, you know, you might not handle nicotine or caffeine really well horribly right now, but you getting your claim your health can allow you to process these compounds better and you're going to have a different effect on your biology on your niacin like the niacin flu because you're in a better state yeah i agree with that the general general baseline here's a better way to think about this you give any kind of supplement to a cadaver nothing will happen because they're dead the more alive a person is the better they're going to respond to things okay so sorry my last question (laughs) thoughts on lithium yeah, this is actually something I just thought about recently because of Dr. Tyler Pansner. And um, essentially, lithium supports B12 transport into the brain, which is what basically clicked me onto this. It's like, wow, I, didn't, I did not know that. And obviously, you know why B12 is so important for neurons and neuronal growth and uh, brain communication, fighting depression and so on. So I can imagine why lithium in small quantities can help people with so many different depressive-like symptoms. Um But I don't know more than that in terms of lithium. I do understand that some people have negative side effects from taking too much lithium. And I wonder if it's because they have other issues like Mm -hmm. uh, lack of iron, lack of zinc, lack of vitamin A, et cetera, that are also important in how the brain makes certain compounds and how the brain makes uh, certain connections with other regions. Yeah, it's interesting because lithium, what, you know, what atomic number lithium is off chance? Uh, oh God, I should know this. It's it in the top. It's, I know lit- it's, it's, is it two? Two? Let's, well, let's helium's see. Two. Two. I think it's, I think it's three. I'm sorry, uh, three, three. There we yeah. go. So it's interesting to me that hydrogen, 
obviously helium, none of the inert gases yeah. is a three. Yeah, three. Hydrogen, uh, none of the inert gases have any real effect on biology, at least as far as I know, because they just don't really mm. exist in nature. But it's like hydrogen, you skip the inert gases, and then lithium, and then all of the essential ones that like are we really need the next like 15 or 16 elements till, you know, uh, after oxygen and then even fluoride, you could argue. But like lithium is just this like kind of like blacked out dot that's just like not talked about and doesn't really mm -hmm. seem to have that big of a role. So I think it's so interesting just from that like chemical biochemistry perspective that it's like we kind of just skip this element. Yeah. You know, there's so much with like metals that makes it so interesting in the body. Um, even things like arsenic, which we consider extremely toxic, you find organisms using it for their own enzymatic purposes. Like they need arsenic so that, that an enzyme turns on. Um, it's been found in some people that this is also required in some small amount. Arsenic is helping a particular enzyme operate. So it's like these metals are very interesting because they can have either good or bad effects in very small quantities. It can really change rapidly. And uh, there's not a lot that's known about them, but they really do run the show. Metals are the catalyst for reactions to occur. And I also thought it was interesting how that I've seen this and you might, uh, again, have some, I would like to hear your thoughts that the, we tend to accumulate heavy metals when we're deficient in the, so like, let's say we're, we have a zinc dependent enzyme and I, for, I forget what re, uh, valence zinc has, I think it's plus two, but so you might accumulate lead, which is also a plus two valence because you are deficient in zinc to keep those enzymes running at a lower rate rather than dying without them on. Yeah, so the oxidation state matters are basically the valence. Um, that does play a role. And But then there's also the transporters and the uh, interaction with transporters. Um, then there's also like proteins. So with lead in particular, to make it as simple as possible, hemoglobin requires iron for it to actually become hemoglobin in the first place and for it to bind to oxygen. However, lead can basically displace the iron and cause globin protein that forces people, uh, that forces cells to be unable to uptake oxygen. And then people become deficient in oxygen and basically causes peripheral damage to the nerves, causes a, a Raynaud's disease, for example, where it's less oxygenation to the extremities. And so those interactions at the protein level play a role. But then there's like the transporters. If you take calcium and magnesium at the same time, they might interact with one another and reduce transport of either or um, based on whatever the transporter for the metals are. Um, and then finally, once again, just general metal chemistry, if you place two metals um, that would react in the same area, it's likely that they're going to cause some change in chemistry that forces your body to uptake one versus the other. That's interesting. So that's just com competition among like the digestive enzymes you're saying. Yeah. Uh, many different things could possibly occur. Um, even like reduction of hydrochloric acid, where it basically, basically becomes alkaline because of the metal. The opposite would also be true though, right? So like there are certain metals that have synergistic effects. Like I know zinc and copper have antagonistic effects, but like maybe, yeah, uh, maybe calcium. I'm just magnesium. Oh, you have one. Magnesium and potassium. Ah, interesting. Yeah, they help the cells, they help the heart conduct effectively. If you don't have one or the other, the heart, um, the myocytes essentially don't conduct as effectively. You need both magnesium and potassium to have good heart health. Awesome. That's, I also thought this was interesting that you guys were talking about that certain uh, chelates. So like, you know, magnesium glycinate, magnesium taurate have different affinities for different organs. And I heard coach Kasson mentioned that. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. I really like his work in the bodybuilding, uh, mechanical tent. He's uh, has a very cool model for lifting. Um, we'll talk about another time, but, uh, he, he was the first person said it's like, it's beneficial to take multiple different chelates because they have different affinities towards different, you know, heart, liver, all that stuff of amino acids. Yeah, that, that's very true. Glycinate goes to the brain, taurate goes to the heart, um, malate goes to mitochondria mostly. So it does provide different routes of transport, essentially. Um, inevitably, all cells will saturate in what they need, whether it's magnesium or some other metal. But yeah, the rate of transport and absorption could be a lot different. You were talking to Georgie a couple of weeks ago and he was talking about the administration of hormones. And he, they said like they thought DHA for a long time was just terribly absorbed topically. But it turns out that the skin is just basically eating all of it because it loves it. Do you think that could also be the case for like, I know magnesium citrate tends to have poor bioavailability, but could it just be the intestines or love magnesium citrate and they're just eating it all up? I wonder if citrate itself, uh, when it gets liberated, 
makes a difference in how the microbiome interacts with the gut. I bet you there might be something there as well. The citric acid is like lactic acid, one of the metabolites that signals in the gut. Um, but I could, I could see that. I could definitely see its affinity for epithelial tissue in the gut. And so less goes to other cells. And then people get some kind of side effect from it, like diarrhea or something. Where can everyone find you? Um, you can find me on Instagram, Thucydides, and or you can find me on my website. Just type in my name, Pedro, last name Doamaral, D-O-A-M-A-R-A-L.com. And uh, you'll find some articles there. Awesome. Well, that's it for this episode of the Thermodiet Podcast. Thank you, Pedro, for coming on. It has been awesome. And uh, until next time, guys, be good.